We are. Sir. Yes, we are. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Before I start, before I start, I'd like to kind of make mention of my uh, honor and distinction to be sitting here in the throne with all you beloved people and Mr. Mondays. And I'm so excited to hear your feedback because usually when I'm here, I'm the drill sergeant. I say, oh, don't talk. We have to finish before 8 o'clock. Now I can be here until tomorrow. So, so we're good. Wow. So we can actually ask. Everyone could breathe and talk at the same time. But uh, as long as it's germane to the subject. Wow. Even during the filming? Even during the filming. I don't care what the people on Facebook. Sorry. Just joking. I love the people on Facebook. But uh, I'm, we're going to be, uh, it's going to be interactive. That's the idea. Um, that's the idea behind Musser Mondays. Musser Mondays is where we take a um, Musser trait and we analyze it and we probe it and we examine it from every angle and we try to distill. Oh, so Sorry, I'm analyzing it. I don't know how to do it. Well, you're alive. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> and we try to distill what is the kernel, what is the core element, what's the root of that particular media, of that particular character trait. Because a lot of times there's confusion. You know, we, we kind of have a fuzzy idea of what it is we're talking about. And if you're not clear about specifically and precisely what it is that you're aiming for, what your objective is, you'll find it very hard to actually nail it, to hit it straight on, to hit the target. And that's why with every Mida, what we do is we kind of, we try to dispel misconceptions or at least clarify for ourselves uh, a working definition of what precisely the media is, and from that we could kind of build a, uh, a strategies and tactics of a first of all to evaluate we where we are holding along the progression of that particular media, and once we know what it is precisely we want to do and where we're holding, we could kind of look to the future and see how we could get from point A to point B from the beginning of our journey to our destination. So that's the idea. Uh, the media that I selected to talk about tonight and next week is one that I feel is very critical. Uh, it's critical uh, and I think there's going to be some assumptions that are going to be challenged. And you may think, um, Rabbi Walby, I actually know all about that. And I'm the expert. And I know precisely what it means, and what it doesn't mean, and where I'm holding, and I have it done. And that's actually my goal. I want to hear that because that's what I assume most people assume. If I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. Because it's something so basic and so fundamental to Jewish life, Jewish practice, certainly Jewish religion, that it seems superfluous to even discuss it. It seems like, why are we even talking about this? Let's go a little bit more, more esoteric. Let's talk, talk to us like adults, you'll say to me. And, uh, and the media that I want to talk about, drum roll please, Psst, Emuna, faith. That's the subject of tonight and the subject, God willing, of next week. Now, before we begin, I think some people might find it interesting that we're going to be talking about Amuna as a trait. Because the trait of traits, the characteristic of characteristics, is that they exist on a spectrum. Right? Someone could be very kind or very unkind. And there's a million spots in the middle. Someone could be very generous or very stingy. And there's all these different markers along the path from one end of the pole to the other end of the pole. <coughs> when that's the way it is with every character, you'd be very, very, very patient. Someone who's so patient on one end of the spectrum. On the other end, you have someone who's totally impatient. Someone who's very quick to get angry. Someone who's very slow to get angry. And someone who's very humble. Someone who's very haughty. And there's all these demarcations along the way. To characterize a Muna as a trait, I think, initially seems surprising because faith is something that we assume, or at least we, our parlance assumes, that you either are a man of faith or you're not a man of faith. You're a believer 
or you're a non-believer. Maybe there's a third realm, you're kind of unsure. You have the, you know, the, the, the atheists and the believers, and then you have the agnostics. But we don't think of it as some sort of sweeping band where there's progression and development. It's kind of like a switch. It's either on or off. You know, you don't have a light switch that it's kind of half, I guess you do have a dimming light. <laughs> okay, maybe. But normally a light is either on or it's off. So there really isn't much to talk about. Switch it on, you're on. Switch it off, you're off. Whereas me does seem to have kind of a progression from one end to the other and, and growth and possibility along the way. I want to posit and I want to propose, first of all, that I want to, uh, that faith and emuna in Jewish sources is not easily defined. And we're going to pass this around the room because uh, I'm going. I have a list of sources here that I want to take and analyze because I think what is abundantly clear is that emuna is not abundantly clear, at least initially. Uh, so that's number one. And number two, uh, I want to see, okay, how does it fit along the Mida uh, progression and how do we maybe even think about addressing where we're holding and how we go towards the future. Okay, is that a good, good starting point? Mm -hmm. Any comments, questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I like your analogy with the dimmer. You like the dimmer analogy? Because I think some people, like myself, Maybe not all of them, but yeah, I, I think maybe. That the Muna, at least in the beginning, is like that. Because <clears throat> some days you think you have the, the Amuna that's going straight to the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And the other days you think that it's like going down. So, so I like that analogy. So, okay, but I think typically most people don't assume that this is so malleable. People assume it's more fixed. It's either yes or no. So I, I selected here some sources to, to ponder because um, maybe we throw this out into the room. You know, what uh, would you suggest, Don, is a definition for Amuna? Uh, I'm not sure about definition, but uh, I think uh, who is the Amuna? Is it the object of our faith? In other words, do we only have faith in man? Do we have faith in God? What do we... Okay. Well, that's a very good question because um, I, I believe that maybe people have presuppositions to answer that question, preconceived notions. Um, is there a, such a notion of faith in man? Is that anathema to Judaism? Or is it only faith in God? It seems to be anathema to Judaism. It does seem to be anathema to Judaism. It's only faith in, only faith in God. Sitter, you talk a lot about not having faith in man. Altiftu chubin Don't have faith in man. All this other stuff. Right. They rely on the horses and the military might. We rely on Hashem. So you're saying faith is only between man and God? No, I don't think it is. Yeah. But, uh, it's tough to have faith in individuals. It, 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 it really, for me, it really and is. Any, anyone's self, too? You got to be. Faith in oneself. Is that Amida? Is that like kind of um, self confidence? You've got kind of you, you to believe in what you say, in your actions. You have to kind of be confident. But is that, is that necessarily a good thing? <laughs> Moshe was the greatest man that ever lived, according to Jew Judaism, and he doesn't seem to be very confident at all. Read the beginning of Exodus. Mm -hmm. He says, well, should I go? Maybe send someone else. Maybe I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. So maybe is, is, is faith in oneself necessarily? But I think we could all agree that faith in aggregate is the most important mitzvah and midah. It's, it's, it's man's connection with God. That's what faith is, I think, right? Yeah, mine. My interpretation of moon is one kind of faith. It's faith in God. Okay. You have different kinds of faith, but a moon is just that one kind of faith. Only faith in God. Well, is it? I mean, I could be wrong, but that's what my interpretation. Is it? Is it actually a faith in God or knowing there is a God? Oh, so okay, okay, but the, but Don brought up the question: What's the object or the subject of our faith? Is it? You say it's only God. Don says, I don't know what Don well, says. Well, I mean, there are more. <laughs> I, th I think a moon is only faith in God. Oh, okay, a moon. A moon. Which, which yeah. we use the word well, we use is a moon. Well, in English. Who is the object of our faith, but what is the source of our faith also? 
what is the source of it or how do we acquire it? Because the source of it assumes that it exists. I'm not so sure about that. I went through the sources. We haven't gone through them yet. But asking the question of what the source is assumes that it exists. What do you mean? We haven't yet defined what it is. The question is Amuna. Amuna is the question, you say Amuna is only to men and God. Is that correct? That's, that, that's, that's what your, I think. That's your stance. That's what, yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is everyone with uh, Ed there? I would agree with that. Uh, okay, we have one, two, three. <coughs> Everyone there with Ed, everyone's with Ed. Amuna is only to man and God. The positive trait of Amuna. Right? Not, not like the, we don't have Amuna in other people. The positive trait of Amuna that's encouraged is only between man and God. Is that everyone agree to that? Yes. Yes? Jay? I think a higher a higher uh, being, but a higher God. being really equals is an equation equals God. So you're with you're with Ed there. So I am. Is there any dissent? Go ahead. From a secular standpoint. Oh no, we're talking from Torah. From Torah. The Muna and Torah, the encourage, the mitzvah of Amuna or the characteristic of Amuna. So everyone suggests here, everyone seems to agree. So the answer is, I'm going to disagree with you guys. I'm going to disagree. And in fact, in this week's parsha, in chapter, I'll give you the chapter, chapter 15, verse, not 15, chapter 14, uh, verse 31, it reads, And Israel saw the great hand that Hashem did to Egypt, and the nation feared Hashem, Vayaaminu b'ashem u'b'moshe avdo. And they had emuna in God and in Moshe, his servant. Make sure that that doesn't become an idol, though. Okay, well, we haven't... This, I'm saying that's... We, we're not even anywhere near the notion of... of, of I, but that's a verse in this week's parsha. Yeah. Wow. This is part of the... Vayaaminu, and they had emuna b'ashem and Hashem u'b'moshe avdo and Moshe, his servant. So, at least from this verse, and this is describing uh, on the aftermath of the, of the splitting of the sea, they, they had this epiphany of, of Amuna in God and in Moshe. Yeah, but everything that Moshe had came from God. Of course, no one questioned that. But there is an idea, clearly, just to answer Don's question, the term Amuna as a plaudit, as a positive characteristic... That is ascribed to God, of course, but it's also included to Moshe. And by the way, this is a little bit of a tricky question, because Moshe is the only one, the only person in all of human history that the term emuna in a man is viewed positively. Everywhere else, it's viewed negatively. And this is not the only verse. Just so you say, maybe this is a, maybe this is an aberration, right? Maybe this is an aberration. Well, well it, was, it says his servant, though. Yeah, Moses, clearly, so it's clearly. Moses is Moses' servant. Okay, let me, let me read another verse. This is not from this week's parsha. It's from next week's parsha. Parsha is Yisrael. Exodus 19.9. This is in the run-up to the Ten Commandments, to the revelation at Sinai. God tells Moshe, and this is 19.9, Moshe, Hashem said to Moshe, Hine anochi ba'olecha ba'avanon, Behold, I will come to you in the thickness of a cloud, why? Ba'avur yishmaha am bedabriyimach, in order that the nation shall hear when I speak to you. Vegam becha ya'aminu le'olam, and also in you they will forever believe. Have emuna ya'aminu. That's another verse. So I, I, I don't want to kind of pursue this point too much, but clearly emuna is not necessarily what we kind of assume. Now, the, I, I think there's other questions that we're going to... Now, let, let's put this off to the side. But the term emuna, viewed positively by the Torah, is in God, but also extends to Moshe. It doesn't extend to anyone else. It doesn't talk about it. And that, that has to, it, this is more related to Moshe and Moshe's role. Because Moshe is the, he is the conduit who gives us what God tells him. So therefore, we can say that faith in Moshe means that faith in Moshe is giving us what God gave him without alter, alteration. So, so let's just put this on the side. But clearly it's not, it's not a simple question. Put that on the side. Go ahead. In, in, order for Moshe, in order for Moshe to have been an optimally effective 
conduit or spokesperson, uh, it seems to me that it was God's thought that he had that, uh, uh, that elevation uh, so as to be maximally effective. Yes, but did that, that's he really true. want the people to uh, worship? I, no, no, it doesn't say worship. It doesn't say worship anywhere. And in fact, people did not worship Moshe. People were always looking for ways to poke holes in Moshe's leadership. So this but I, I, think, I, think Don, I think Don at the nail on the head by saying with that they believe in God and Moshe, his servant, i.e. they believe Moshe, they believe in Moshe vis-a-vis -vis Moshe's capacity as being God's servant. Does that make sense? So they're not believing in Moshe as an individual, they're believing in what Moshe represents, and that is a prophet of unadulterated clarity that he is not interfering with the divine communication at all. So when Moshe gives us Torah, whose Torah is that? That's God's Torah. And Moshe didn't contribute any of his own commentary. There's no, he has no poetic license. He has no, and in fact, Maimonides tells us, the Talmud tells us, that we have to believe that the Torah was not, Moshe did not contribute at all to the content of the Torah. He was nothing more than a conduit, like a pipe. He didn't, he didn't at all, and that, that, and that, I think, is what it refers to. I don't know if it's the 12 attributes of faith, or somewhere it doesn't even say that Moses is the greatest prophet. That we have to believe yes. that he was the greatest yes. prophet. And, but he did not contribute right. towards but Torah. We still have to believe that, don't we? Yeah, okay, but we feel, we feel, like, feel like the belief in Moshe is kind of the next step. Maybe not this week, and certainly not, probably not next week, maybe the week after. I want to, I want to ask one more question here to the, to the floor here. Uh, would everyone agree that Amuna is a mitzvah? Everyone, would everyone agree to that? Yeah? Yeah, yeah this is on 13 mitzvahs. And how many of them would you, would you estimate are Amuna? Was it, is it one? Is it two? Is it ten? Because it's a connector to the Without the Muna, then it would be like. So you're saying is that a Muna is necessary for all of Torah? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just I'm asking a simple question. A Muna is a mitzvah. Everyone agrees to that. I agree to that. This is not a trick. Not a trick question. And what is a mitzvah? How many of the 613 is it? Is it one? Is it Osama? Let's, let's, let's simplify this. The first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, right? That's, I would say, that's a muna, right? Believe that this is true. It's just a belief that we have that God exists. I, I would say it's 613, because without a muna, you wouldn't care about the other 612. But, yeah, that's what he was saying. I'm with you. So you're saying it's a necessary component. Yeah. But it's not necessarily, it's not in the midst of sending away the mother bird before you take away the, the, the baby. Is that anything to do with the Muna? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems like it's a mitzvah on its own, right? Mm -hmm. So you say it's 613. Yeah. So this why is an issue. Why would you do that if you, if you didn't have faith in mitzvah? Well, that's a question of your motivation. That's a question of your motivation. But is a Muna what's going to cause the mitzvah, or is Amuna the result of the mitzvah? This is a little bit of a tricky thing. Are you, what you're saying is that Amuna is the cause of all the mitzvahs, correct? If you didn't have Amuna, you wouldn't do any mitzvahs. Right. It's a cause. Yeah. Right. My question is, how many mitzvahs result in Amuna, i.e., fulfill this mitzvah, and then you'll have a muna. That's the mitzvah. That's it's the mitzvah. like what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. Well, you're saying is that that uh, emuna is the uh, is a component of every mitzvah. I would agree to that. But I would say being Jewish is also a component of every mitzvah, right? I would say being alive is a component. A lot of components of every mitzvah. You know, if someone is in a coma, it's very hard for them to do mitzvahs. So the fact that emuna is necessary to fulfill mitzvahs, it doesn't mean that the mitzvahs themselves are mitzvahs to have a muna. There are components that you would need to fulfill it. Well, why wouldn't you have a muna after you did the, the mitzvah? Why wouldn't your muna increase? Well, see, okay, I maybe it would. I think I agree with that. You would. How could it not? Huh? How could it not? I mean, you've done the mitzvah. And... So, you, so you're saying if someone, if someone eats matzah on Pesach, 
before Pesach, they had a certain level of amuna along our spectrum. And then after they eat the matzah, they're on a different level in the spectrum. But that's, yeah? So you're saying is that, mitzvah, that amuna is not only something you need to cause the mitzvah, it's also a result of the mitzvah. Well, not necessarily, because sometimes you do, you do some of these mitzvahs. What if you do it rote and there is no... There is no passion while you're doing this. So you're saying you, it won't result in anything. Yes. But can we agree, assuming you do a mitzvah by rote, that you don't need a moon to do it either? Right, exactly. So it's not a cause nor an effect. Exactly. Do a mitzvah by rote, yeah, well then you could be a, you could be a little android, the, a little robot. But, but the, the, reason you, the reason you'd be but doing it by... Well, yeah. that's my point. The point is the moon is not a... It, it, it the moon has to be, at least in my definition of what I've been taught or thought, is that a moon means that you are truly invested in an idea or a thought or a belief or whatever, control and all together. And you're you're totally putting your lack of a better word, your Nishama and your heart together in praying to Hashem. Praying. What about sending away the mother bird? Okay, so let, let, let me show you. Let me add some more sources well, you, to this discussion. Yeah, well, if you're doing it by rote, you're only doing it by rote because you had a moon in the beginning to practice all these mitzvot, and now you're practicing. You're starting to do them by rote, but you had to have the inspiration in the beginning to start doing. It. You wouldn't be doing by rote if you didn't really. Unless you're programmed to do it by rote, but people yeah. were programmed to do it by rote. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not even sure it's I'm not even sure it's possible for a human being to do anything. By well, by by habit, not 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 means we, what what we say. Of course, uh, it's a habit that you do, but you don't have a feeling. That uh, yes, of course, it's not it's not mindless. It's not totally no. bereft of any motivation. But there's no real feeling in your heart. There's no inspiration. There's no meaning. Be a, a lot of passion, but there's got to be something. Yeah. yeah, but is that a moon? No, I don't know. So I want to throw in a, some sources here to to expand the conversation. So. The Talmud in the book of Makos tells us something that every school child knows. And it's so obvious, you wonder why the Talmud has to tell it to us. The Talmud says that there's 613 mitzvahs. It's so obvious, right? Why does the Talmud need to tell it to us? Right? Rabbi, why does the Talmud need to tell us? I mean, so every kid knows that. What? Anyone has an answer to that question? Or every kid knows it because the Talmud is told. Booyah, saying. this is the only source where it says it. This is it. <laughs> Everyone ne- learned it from this. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> the Sishon 30 Mitzvah is because the Talmud says it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ed. Uh, so the Sishon 30 Mitzvah. And yeah. each Mitzvah is an instruction given to us by God, right? God says, do this Mitzvah and do that Mitzvah. And all told, we have Sishon 30 Mitzvah. Mm-hmm. Now, if God gave us 613 and not 612, it means that there's something needed by every mitzvah, right? It's not, there's no superfluous mitzvah. There's no, everything is meaningful. Everything has to have a meaning, because if it did have a meaning, why, then if there's only 612 meanings, then only, you only need to have 612 mitzvahs. From the fact that there's 613 mitzvahs, it must be that there's 613 motivations for God, at least, for giving us a mitzvah, right? Otherwise, he would have he given us less. So Talmud starts off with the understanding that this, each mitzvah has its own reason. Each mitzvah, there's, there's a reason to do every single mitzvah, because if there wasn't, if it was just a repetition of the previous thing, there's no need to do it. Correct? That's how the Gemara starts off. And then the Gemara launches into a whole discussion of trying to simplify mitzvahs. And the reason why it's not simple because 613 mitzvos and 613 reasonings and 613 motivations is a little bit complicated for us. We're not so sophisticated. Moshe maybe could have done it, Aaron, Joshua, those were great people. Mm-hmm. Says so the Talmud, by the time King David comes around, he says, I want to simplify the mitzvos and I'm going to categorize the mitzvos. I'm going to break them down into broader categories. So, yes. Of course, there's really 613 categories. I'm going to collect them and make them, make, make them into broader categories. Comes along King David, and he kind of says there's really 11 core principles of all 613. 
And then a few generations later, Isaiah comes and he says, I want to make it even simpler. Eleven things hard to keep track of. That's so eleven things. So many different things to keep track of. We're become, you know, this generations as the generations progress, our capacities diminish. Let's make it easier. So Isaiah says, you know what? I'm going to will it down to six. And comes along uh, Micah, and he whittles it down to three. And eventually it's being whittled down. Comes along Chabakurk. Chabakurk was one of the last of the prophets. And he whittles it down to only one principle. There's only one principle for all. The very broad principle that covers everything. And what is that? V'tzadik be'emunato yichyeh. And a tzadik lives with a muna. Thus, according to the Talmud, the idea of a is very expansive. It incorporates every one of the 613 can fit under its canopy. Yes, of course, each mitzvah on its own has its own reasons. But once we come around, we can simplify everything. All the reasons for all the mitzvahs is pursuit of a And indeed, Ed was right. Ed said that the 613 activities that bring us towards Amuna, that are oriented about fulfilling our Amuna, and you're right. And the truth is that Amuna is also, we can legitimately say there's only three or two or three mitzvahs of Amuna. Because there's Amuna the mitzvah, which is believe in God, and then there's Amuna the idea, which is 613 activities that you need to do if you want to achieve this idea. And therefore, we can safely say that Amuna is not something which is cut and dried. If there's 613 various steps to achieve the totality of the Amuna that the, that, that, that the Torah outlines for us, then obviously it's much more expansive than just, do I believe? Do I not believe? It's a whole world and really all of Torah. All of Torah is pursuit of some idea called Amuna. The broader Amuna, not just the mitzvah of Amuna, kind of fixed, you fulfill it, you're done. It's a life pursuit of becoming a tzaddik, becoming a tzaddik who lives with the Amuna. And thus, obviously, Amuna is a very broad idea. In the end of last week's Parsha, Parsha's bow, there is a teaching from the Ramban, from Nachmanides. And he says a very famous teaching, a very famous statement, or, or, or kind of lawn teaching. My grandfather used to say about this Ramban is that every Jew has to know this, one, this Ramban by heart. So, of course, I assume everyone here already knows it by heart. <laughs> so I'm just going to remind you what it says at the end. <laughs> just, just, just reminders. Sometimes you forget, right? So he has a very, very long essay on this topic where he says the reasons for mitzvos is pursuit of faith, of amuna. When we use faith today, it means amuna. That's the reason for, 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 for mitzvahs. And then he ends off like this. I'm just going to read you one line here, because it's part of a bigger picture. I would advise you, if you can, find this Ramban and read it, because it's, I read it slowly, because it's a little bit complex, but not too complex where you can handle it. This is the last line there. Vekavanas kol ha-mitzvot. And the purpose of all the mitzvot, shena'amin belokeinu, that we shall have emuna in our God. Simple. The reason why we have all the mitzvos is that we should have faith in God. This leaves us with a lot of questions. Namely, if I refrain from eating the cheeseburger, says the Ramban, that's a way of someone achieving a muna. Faith in God. If I if I capitulate and I eat the cheeseburger. I have less faith. And, and Don was right. Eating matzah, chewing those cracker breads, that's an act of faith. You're right. But the question is, how does that work? If I have the, 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 mother, uh, the mother's bird sitting on top of the egg, I send the mother away, what does that have to do with the muna at all? It doesn't seem to be in any way related to our relationship with our Creator. So obviously there are some questions here to answer. Okay? Yeah, we're good? I want to continue with some more sources. And...
the sources that we're going to initially pick from sources in in the scripture, and then we're going to move to other sources in the Talmud, and we're at the end we're going to try to see if we can come up with one clear definition of what a moon is and how it fits into every one of our sources. And then next week, well, then the homework is going to be. Sorry, I give homework. My brother doesn't give homework. I give homework. It's Muster Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I'm not going to grade them, unless you want me to. But the homework is going to be, once we know what a moon is, to try to see where we're holding it, to try to kind of figure out where we are along this path. Okay? So that, that's going to be the homework. Um, so I want to look at um, Abraham. There's a verse in Genesis that says, God tells Abraham, look up and see all the stars. Try to count them. And your children, they will be as numerous as the stars. Uh, now, Abraham at that time is really old. His wife is also really old. It doesn't seem likely that I'll have any more children. But the verse continues, Ve'he'emin b'ashem. And he believed he had a muna in Hashem. Abram had a muna. Let's clap. Abram is a prophet. Abram's turning over the whole world. Abraham's teaching and lecturing about God. He's been doing his whole life. Why are we making a big deal that Abram had a muna? Shouldn't that be the baseline of everything like you guys told me? Like I would agree to you? The fact that Abram has a muna, the Torah, it's the verse. Vehem in Bashem, it's from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. What's the big deal that Abraham had a muna? Isn't that something we expect of children in grade school? Not veteran prophets that are engaged ter- talking to angels, talking to God, and changing the world. That's number one. Number two, in Exodus. Exodus chapter 4, Moshe and Aaron go and lobby the leaders of the Jewish people. And they do tricks with them. They take a staff and they throw it on the ground and they, uh, they pour some water on the floor and it turns into blood. And he sticks his hand into his shirt and takes it out and it's all white, turns it back in. And people are wowed, says the verse. Vaya amen ha'am. And the people had a muna. So if you were to ask me a question, when did the people have a muna? Chapter 4. Verse, verse, which verse was it? Sorry, I lost track of here. Uh, chapter 4, verse 31. The people have a muna. Done. Last week's parasha, it's much later. They already have a muna. They see the splitting of the sea. Says the Torah, stop, I have to tell you something. Vayamina Bashem, they believe in God. What do you mean? They believed in God already yesterday. Or, or a year ago. And in a few weeks... Uh, after this episode, uh, uh, on the uh, doorstep of Mount Sinai, why are we having Sinai? They should have a Muna. What do you mean? Didn't you already tell me twice they had a Muna? Furthermore, this is going to be very surprising. Book of Numbers, chapter 20. Moshe and Aaron make a blunder. They have a rock. Instead of talking to the rock, they strike it. God tells them, and this is from Numbers 20:12. Vayomer Hashem al Moshe. Hashem said to Moshe, Vel Aaron, and to Aaron, to Aaron, Ya'an lo he'emantem bi, because you do not have emuna in me, therefore you're not going to come into the land of Israel. Mm-hmm. Moshe and Aaron don't have emuna? How is that even possible? So those are the scripture that, of course, I think contribute to at least the issue not being so simple. The Talmud. When I say Talmud, I mean Talmudic literature. Noah. How long did Noah spend building the ark? 120 years. God gives them blueprints, build an ark. It's got to be 600 feet long and 200 feet tall and 150, well, 100 feet tall and 60 feet wide. And we make enough compartments to fit all the animals in it. Stockpiled rain. If you were to say, did, did, Noah, did Noah have a Muna or not? Yeah. Obviously, right? Someone who dedicates 120 years of his life to a project of building the world's 
largest boat that has zero utility because you're building it on Earth and you can carry it. The only reason why it has any viability is if some sort of storm that the world has never seen before that totally covers all the mountaintops, only then does it have any utility. Clearly, Noah has a Muna. Okay, let's look at Genesis 7 7. The verse tells us that. Vayavo Noach Ubanov, and Noach and his sons, and his wife, and his wife's sons, they came to the ark, mipnei mei hamabul, because, as a result of the waters of the flood. So those words, why did Noah come to the ark? Did he come because God told him? No, the verse is very clear. He came because of the waters. Says Rashi, what does this mean? Af Noach mikatnei Emunah. Noah also, he has only a little bit of emunah. A little bit. Ma'amin, they know ma'amin. He believes he has emunah, but he doesn't really believe. Why? Because he only walks into the ark because of the water, not because God tells him. Now this, of course, is striking. How can we say that Noah has only a little bit of emunah? He believes, but he doesn't believe. How is that possible? This is Noah. This is the great hero of the flood story. He had no need to go in the ark until yeah. the water came. Right. Oh, 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 you're trying to justify. I'm, I'm okay trying to find justification. But explain to me the text. Talmud makes it clear. Noah, at least by its definition of Amuna, he only had a little bit of it. I think oh. the, the point might be, and I might be reading this wrong, that just like the Jewish people go in and out of Amuna all the time, and even after the revelation of Mount Sinai, they lost their, their Amuna. So did, so did some of our sages lose their Amuna. Okay, but what? They always have to strive to keep that Amuna because you lose it, then you bring it back, and you lose it, then you bring it back. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point you were trying to make. I'm not sure if it's true or not. But well, let's look at two more sources. Yeah. What, what, what you're saying, I like it. prophets are microcosms of the <coughs> Yeah. Well, I, well I, yeah. what you're yeah. saying is that, that Amuna kind of is. Uh, is yeah. I, I I like the idea. I don't like the application of it because I I don't want it's not a, I don't want to say that it's a fickle thing. I, I'm I'm wary of saying that someone like Noah he was kind of wishy washy. I'd rather say he was resolute at whatever level he was. Yeah, but he lost. But at times you lose. He, you know, most struck the rock. He might have lost an Amunai at that at that point. Mm -hmm. But he was told he hit the rock. He was not told to strike the rock. Okay, but he, but he, but m what would you imagine? You know, the Muna of Moshe it was probably the, the the greatest, the greatest, right? So he didn't lose, he didn't lose his end. He lost it, or he kind of went a step back. Maybe step back. Okay, I, I agree that there is a band all the way from zero Muna to one hundred percent Muna. Moshe might have been at ninety nine point nine nine, and then he went to ninety nine point nine eight or something like that. So he gets punished for that because he went. Yeah. That's a separate question. Yeah. That's a separate question. I don't want but, but, but clearly, I think what is abundantly clear, and I don't think there's room, well, there was always room to question it, but I, I think from the sources, it's, un, it's incontrovertible that Imuna is not an if-or question, clearly, and what it means precisely is still a little bit elusive, clearly. Now, there's two more stories I want to show you, and these ones are going to open up a window, three more sources, at least. Uh, I might, right? uh, there's a few more sources I want to show you that, that may open up a window as to what exactly we're talking about. The first one is from the Talmud in the Book of Sota. The Talmud is talking about the destruction of the temple, second temple, in the year 70 by the Romans. And it describes uh, a cliff that the Jewish people fell over, spiritual cliff, from... Uh, before the temple was destroyed till after, afterwards. It, it was kind of a shift in the people, and they, there were certain heights of spiritual achievement that they could not reach. And it gives a whole list of things, and one of the things is, Batlu upastu anche amano. There's no longer men of faith. That, the men of faith, by whatever definition the, the Talmud does use, and it's going to give us a definition, that became a thing of the past, says the Talmud, what does that mean? What does it mean that people of faith? It means, quite simply, people who believe in God. 
שמאמין עם הקודש ברוך הוא. But they have faith in God. That doesn't work. Like, well, what's the metric to determine what is emuna, what's not emuna? So the Talmud, this is the metric that they used. If someone has bread in his basket, enough food for his family today, but has exactly zero plans for tomorrow. Food for today, no food for tomorrow. And someone like this, who says, Oyve, what am I going to eat tomorrow? What am I going to feed my kids tomorrow? That's someone who has limited faith. Or, he can have enough faith that God's going to provide for him. That's right, so you won't even ask the question. That's true. That's implied, obviously. So what does it mean to have faith? It means you have food today. Tomorrow, you have no food. Nothing. The cupboards are empty. Your credit cards are maxed out. There's no food. You have no, you have no, and you have no plans, aside from God, of how to do that. Someone who has faith by this metric is someone who does not say, Oh, you're what am I going to eat tomorrow? He knows that he'll have food provided for him by God. Okay, that's the first definition of what faith is. Go ahead. There's a famous uh, prayer in the Christian script, scriptures that says, uh, Give us this day our daily bread. What do you think they got it from? <laughs> That's what I'm asking you. Where, where does that come from? Okay, so this week's parasha, we read about the manna. The characteristic of the manna was precisely this. You look at the story of the manna. It repeats it and it stresses it again and again that it was food in abundance, food for millions of people with exactly you know, a, a one-day shelf life. That's it. You try to stockpile it, it would get... Uh, it would get either diminished or it would get spoiled. It was precisely this. It was only food for today and no plans for tomorrow. Nothing. And it was all about reliance on God. Entire, entire reliance on God. Here, here we have a definition, at least a tentative definition. What is Amuna by the Torah standards? It is the capacity to be at ease with food today, no food tomorrow, and not a concern in the world. Oh my God. That's the definition. Well, uh, well, that's the ma- a man of faith. Now we have limited faith. We're less than that. But clearly, there is a band, right? People of limited faith can still exist, but people of just a man of faith, not a, not great faith, not like not something special, just a regular guy, a person, average person of faith. That's what it demands. Go ahead. All right. Could you could you put it uh, define what the, what it means to believe that God will provide? Okay, I'm just going to read you what it says, because because I'm it, what it's implied. It's not clear. I don't want to I don't want to give a, a precise definition um, outside of the words. I'm going to read you what the word says here. Whoever has food in his bread today and says, "What will I eat tomorrow?" is nothing but a man of limited faith. That's all it says. What's implied is a man who has real faith does not say, what will I eat tomorrow? But it's implied. It's not clear. It's implied that they rely on God to provide for them. How that works, or how they could muster up the courage, as we would think of it, to do that, that's an unanswered question. Uh, though I would amend my previous statement by saying it's not an act of courage. And this is, this is a little bit of a subtle point. If someone says, I have food today, I don't have food tomorrow, oh, if I, what am I going to feed my kids? Oh, I'll rely on God. That's not a man of faith. It's not an act of courage, of martyrdom, of dedication. It's just you're at ease. You know God will feed you. You don't even think about it. You don't even consider the option of any problems existing. That's what it's describing here. It's saying the person of faith does not even say, what will I eat tomorrow? doesn't say, I won't eat tomorrow. God will feed me. It's self-understood. So obviously, this is, to us, this is like, whoa, that's the mountaintop. How, do, how does someone even get there? I want to show you guys another source here, which seems to be, the next two sources will be so radically different that we'll see really how they're all saying the same thing. The next source, it sounds so counterintuitive, 
and it reads like this. this is from the Talmud in Brachos 24b. It's talking about prayer. Someone who makes uh, pray, who prays loudly, who makes his voice heard, behold, is a man of limited faith. <laughs> So you think of someone who's pious, I'm praying to Hashem, all right. No, that's a man of limited faith in the Talmud. The people of real faith, they don't, they, don't, they don't wail and scream. They talk to God. And to us, that's exactly the opposite of what we would imagine. We think the person who's pious is the one who's praying really loudly to Hashem in the forest or in the prayer, in, in, in the shul. That's what we think. Here it says the exact opposite. Someone who does raise their voice in prayer, that's someone who has limited faith. Someone who has a lot of faith doesn't raise their voice in prayer. And where is that sourced? In Brachos 24b. Talmud? Talmud. Well, are we talking about when you're around other people or when you're by yourself? Doesn't matter. Well, doesn't matter. And the question is, what? What? Rabbi, did you sure you can get it wrong? <laughs> Seems like the opposite should be more true. By the way, just a... a as an aside, whenever you see something like this in the Talmud, that it seems exactly the opposite, you know you have you have opportunity to, to learn something. It means whenever you stop and say this this doesn't make sense, boom, there's a lesson there. There's a lesson hidden there, and you have to kind of re reimagine what the possibilities are. What it's saying here is that someone of higher faith will will pray. Uh, more inaudibly than someone of limited faith. Now, someone who doesn't pray at all, that's not faith at all, right? It means if you compare two people, man of limited faith and man of a lot of faith, I think for us, if we had a limited faith, by this standards, we'd probably be very good. Probably. But by the Talmuds, uh, the two baskets, the Talmuds comparing, small faith, a lot of faith, the small faith would pray loudly, a lot of faith would pray quietly. And the question is why? It, doesn't seem to, it seems to be counterintuitive again. The last source, a uh, very strange source, well, at least initially, right, raises questions, is from the book of Shabbos on page 31a. By the way, uh, we have the whole Talmud over here on the shelves in the Levitt Family Library. And it has the entire Talmud, all 73 editions in, in, in English. So whenever I say a quote from the Talmud, you can just write it down, find the book, and you'll find it. Because it's all, it's numbers. 24A means it's the first page of 24. It's simple. 24A, 24B. You, you could actually find what I'm saying. Is if you, it in English? Or is it what, what kind of... You could only check it out, there, check the order after, after the class. But, so we quoted one from Sota 48B. Brachos 24b as well. And the third one is from Shabbos 31a. And the Talmud is deducing and deriving a verse in Scripture. The verse in Isaiah reads, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of these six words that are put together. The Talmud trying to figure out what these six words even mean. So, if you've ever heard about the six questions that they ask someone after they die, you ever heard that? Heard that? After someone dies, there's six questions that they ask them. Oh, three. No, there's six questions they ask them. I thought it was just your name. But that's a different source. It's all security. <laughs> that's, the, that, that's a different source where they ask him their name. This the source that talks about six questions. Did you do business yeah. Yeah. with integrity? Right. Oh, yeah. Those, those questions are from that page in Shabbos 31a. That's where it comes from. It's six questions. Um, and it's also deducing this verse. But the Talmud's trying to figure out a verse, and I'll read the beginning of the verse. V'haya emunas itecha. Emunas, the faith itecha of your times. Faith of your times. And the Talmud uses these six words to be referencing the six sections of the Mishnah. And it says the first section of the Mishnah talks about agriculture, and that refers to Amuna. The next section that talks about holidays, that's Itecha, the times, etc. It goes on for the six orders of the Mishnah, and each one of them corresponds to one word of that verse. 
Okay? So, the Talmud has compared the word emuna to the laws of agriculture. It seems, at least on the surface, to be strange. What does emuna have to do with the laws of agriculture? So, the Tosfos there, on the page, uh, it, it tells us, and quotes the Jerusalem Talmud, and it says that a farmer is someone that has emuna. Why? Because a farmer plants and believes in God. So this is surprising. Because if you were to say, who, the which profession is most associated with faith in Judaism? You'd say, well, maybe it's the rabbi, maybe it's the soldier, maybe it's the, you know, someone who's you know, faced with the perilous situation. Who has faith? No one would say, you know, we should let's go to the Joe the Farmer. They're the one we should go for lessons on Amuna. They're the experts. You know, we don't want our kids to become rabbis and scholars and Torah teachers. They should go into the agriculture. They should become farmers and then they'll have faith. Very strange thing. Someone who plants, that's someone who has faith in God. One, again, like this is a kind of a head scratcher. Right, don't you think? Well, that could be more than just agriculture. You could be planting seeds for the future that will ripen after your lifetime. Ooh, so you're saying that this is someone who is investing, ah. investing in the future. Ooh, someone who has a moon is someone who's thinking about all my buzz. Is that what you're suggesting, Don? Well, yeah, the future. You're planting seeds. Mm, very, oh, okay, that's an idea. Wow, okay. But also, it's like, that's a very clever idea. If I like that. If you're a farmer, go ahead. Then you're also. It's not like. I don't think, at least, long ago, farmers thought about a lots of profit. They they weren't really thinking about money. They were thinking about their agriculture. Um, What's that to do with the moon? Because. You have to. If you, if you this is the if this you, is the paradigm of Amuna, the farmer. No, because yeah, he, he does believe. Huh? They have to have faith in the yeah. weather and that God will provide good weather that, that, that for growing be the fine. crops and the animals to. But what about the stockbroker or the stock trader? Don't they no. need faith in God? No. They that the know. bears will but overwhelm the bulls, or vice versa. A lot of industries demand, no. you know. There's so many. You know, Stockbrokers, I think, have the least amount of because, oil. Because it's God who made these seeds grow in the first place. God doesn't make a stock grow. God did make God seeds doesn't make grow. a stock grow? No, the Federal Reserve. <laughs> the Federal Reserve? <laughs> yeah. no, the Federal Reserve only interferes with it. The Federal Reserve interferes with the stock. Okay. I, I, think, I think certainly on the surface, it's an interesting statement. The farmer has a moon. Huh. I want to. I want to suggest. I want to suggest an idea of what emuna precisely is. Emuna, of course, means what we think it means. It means our connection to God. You know, there's some problems with our connection to God. We have a problem with that. It's not intuitive. We're not. Our senses don't help us. We don't see God. There's no way for us to see God. It's not possible. So we're working at a deficit, right? We have, we have headwinds. We're facing an uphill battle to achieve emuna. It, it's not an easy thing because you want to see God, you can't see God. You want to smell God, you can't smell right? It's hard for us to connect, to interface with an entity that we cannot connect to on a sensory level. And Talmud even declares that the Almighty is roev ainanir, the Almighty sees but is unseen. There's no way for us to see them. By the way, our soul is also unseen. For us to connect to our soul is also very difficult. We don't know of it, its existence. We don't know of its agenda. We don't feel it. Our feelings, our senses, are only linked with our body, not our soul. If you're hungry, your body's hungry, right? What about if your soul's hungry? Your soul's hungry? What does that even mean? Well, spiritually we can know when we're spiritually hungry. You think so? Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. You can feel it. You can like feel it? it? Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you don't study Torah for 12 hours, you feel a groaning pain in your stomach? It takes three days. It takes three days? <laughs> but how long does it take for you, after you haven't eaten, to feel the grumble in your stomach? 26 minutes. 20, that it? 26 minutes? <laughs> 
your body. <laughs> I, I got it down to the uh, Your soul, your soul needs Torah like your body needs bread. Your soul needs Torah like your body needs water. Your soul needs Torah like your body needs oxygen. Water? Yeah. Okay, but you still feel it. Okay. I, I, I agree with you that uh, that uh, that you could survive without three days without food. But I want to know how you're feeling. Let, let's look at everyone in your paper. I want, I want to take a snapshot of people. Uh, 22 hours into Yom Kippur, yeah. look at the grump on your face. <laughs> if you felt what your soul felt, you'd feel like that after 22 hours without Torah. So yes, maybe you could feel your soul, but it's not. It's much more withdrawn from you, clearly. So we have problems with our connection to our spiritual half, to God, our spiritual master, to our soul, our spiritual identity, and of course to Torah, which is our spiritual agenda. <laughs> These are not easy things for us to connect to. Uh, and Amuna is about bridging that divide, about connecting to those entities. Now, let's look at agriculture for a little bit here. So what happens when a person plants an apple tree? So what do they take? They take a seed, they dig a hole, they put it in the ground, they cover the hole. Where's the seed? Water. Where's the seed? We'll still get to the water. Where's the seed? In the ground. The seed's hidden. You don't see the seed. You pour water and you wait. What happens on the ground? It starts to rot and decompose and get. You know, if you dig it up after three months, you'll say, okay, what do we have here? Absolutely nothing. And if I dropped an alien into your orchard and I asked him to make an assessment after a few months of you doing what you did, what is this going to... We have inedible seeds in inedible soil. You're sprinkling water. What does that do? I don't know. We have sunlight. What does that do? I don't know. You dig it up after a little bit. You have nothing. If, if you were to ask an untrained observer, someone who has not been corrupted by conventional wisdom, <laughs> you bring the alien here and say, what do you see? You say, I see death and, and decay. That's what I see. The seed was inedible to begin with. All I did is threw into an edible soil, tried chewing soil. My kids do it a little bit. They like it, but it's still not edible. I think kids still need it as part of it there diet. But it's not edible. It's not food. And all you do is you add some water, which is also not edible. It's water. If you ask someone to analyze this, they'll say there is no way that this could possibly ever result in a tree bearing delicious fruit that themselves can go on and make billions of orchards of apple trees. There's no way that that's going to work. There's no way. That's, that's fiction. If they have no idea. Now, now okay, so, so you say to me, okay, so, so planting apples, that is something that we cannot explain how it works. No one knows how it works, and I researched this. No one knows how this works. No, no one actually knows how this works. But not only that, what's your question? They don't know. No one knows how this works. It's got this, that's right. You're getting to the point here. Uh, yet, let me ask you a question. Let's assume we were treating this as we ought to. There's a process, planting, that is a miracle. There's no way for us to explain what's happening. It's not logical at all. There's no way for us to kind of connect to it on a sensory level. And what would happen if we were to doubt whether or not this is true. Think about this. What's at stake if this gets corrupted? If the process life of Earth, life, all life ceases to exist very soon after this magic ceases to work. Think about that. Everyone you know, all your cousins and all your children and grandchildren and neighbors and employees and everyone you know, the whole world, the United States, 50 million people, we're all dead. 
the whole world, it's worse than a nuclear holocaust. It's terrible. All of that happens, Every, all the animals are gone, everything's gone. We all cease to work if the miracle of something out of nothing, of ex nihilo creation, of planting a seed into the ground, it starts to decompose and pff, voila, overnight, not overnight, saying, but out of nowhere comes along fruit and produce. Everyone dies if that stops happening. Why are we not worried about this? Why is this not a biggest political issue in the world? The entire world hangs in a balance. We have faith that that's going to grow into a tree. Okay, so you said, oh, whoa, okay. So let's, let's, read this, let's, let's read this verse again here. Someone who is a farmer has faith, because when they plant, they believe in God. Is it possible for someone to be an atheist and a farmer? Sure. Of course, right? Yeah. So what does that have to do with Amuna? The answer is that even the Amuna, what yes, it means it is, is someone who lives with a reality that they cannot possibly explain. But they don't question it. To live with a reality that you cannot possibly fully understand, but it governs your life, all life depends upon it, and you never even stop and think. You don't stay up at night and say, How, what do we do? All civilization is toast if this stops working. And there's no way to explain how it does work. We, there's no way for us to understand how it works. It's all miracles. All on the ground, there's something happening. We don't even know what it is. And it's not logical to us. You take an inedible, plus an inedible, add some time, sunlight, and water, and you have miracle. There's no way for us to explain it, yet... We don't ever question it for a second. We take it for granted. It's fact. It's the way the world works. We all rely on it. We all depend upon it. And that's just the way it is. That is what Emuna is. Emuna is to live your life, to never question a reality that's entirely invisible and something that's very hard for us to even conceptualize. It's a fact. It's true. Everything depends upon it. And we are not capable of necessarily fully understanding it, but we never question its existence. That's what Amuna is. If you're saying, I'm hearing, I'm hearing, could you also visually uh, like, translate that to the sun? Everybody all over the world believes, with, like you're saying, Imuna, that the sun will always rise and then set, always rise and then set, and rise and set, and rise and set. Yeah, but, the, uh, Imuna, but the sun, we know what it is. Yeah. But there, there are other there are other examples with the sun that the Talmud is bringing, but this is I think this is invisible. That's the point. But you got the core idea. You got the core idea. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's a great Thank you. That's not mine, it's the Talmud. Now, let's say someone who's praying. Let's just take someone who's praying. Who, who are they talking to? They're talking to God, right? Hopefully. That, that's what it is. That's what prayer is. When someone talks to God and they have a Muna, what are they actually what are they actually doing? They're talking to a king. That's what they're doing, right? It's real. It's, it's like it's a reality that they're living with. It's someone who's a tzaddik who lives with the moon, which means they take it like the like, like the farmer who plants. This is just the way things are. Things operate like this is this is fact. This is what happens. I'm talking to God. <coughs> Somebody says I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. Let's talk about it. Ah. What they're doing is they're ritualizing it. Someone who ta who prays loudly, as if. It's something that it's some sort of ritual, the ceremony that has to happen for me to talk to God. What they're essentially doing is saying, no, it's not as real. It's, it's kind of a thing. It's a thing that's not our reality. It, 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 it's something that's kind of in the sky. It's like, a, it's like kind of a fuzzy idea. No one talks about agriculture, the fact that we all live as a result of that miracle, as a fuzzy idea. It's real. The second someone starts making rituals out of mitzvos, 
what they're in a, in a sense saying that God is not real or God is less real. Therefore, I should act in a different way than I would if it was real. Sorry, man, I went to fall off. Not the kind of thing I want to happen when you're talking about a right? So, yeah, so That's what, good. Yeah. So what you're saying by being loud is you're, you're ritualizing? Oh, yeah. And, and we but, that's what the, but you know something, Rabbi? I, when, I go, when you go to synagogue, mm -hmm. they're loud. Who's loud? When they pray, a lot of people are very loud when they pray. You mean when we're singing? Yeah. Well, that's different, but we're supposed to pray. Okay, so so the Gemara does say if someone if someone needs to pray to, if someone needs to pray loudly to concentrate, that's okay. okay. But let me read you what Rashi says on that Gemara in in Brachos about praying loudly. When someone prays loudly, says Rashi, Ti ilu filas lachash. Someone is in a, in a sense demonstrating. It's as if God does not hear me when I whisper. Of course God hears when you whisper, right? It's kind of like taking a reality and turning it into, an, into some sort of thing that's not kind of real. There's a guy in my synagogue, when he doesn't come very often, when he doesn't believe it, it's, he's like singing the opera. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, very, it's very embarrassing. Well, you know, I, 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 I think, think there's such to... a prayer that you have to be... I mean, if you're doing... Um, the Amidah, you're quiet when you're doing that. You're concentrating, you're some people shackle, you're shackle, whatever it's called. But there's certain other prayers that everybody gets into when it's louder. Yeah, that, that, that would be okay. And the Gemara says that if someone's praying loudly because they want... Attention. What, no, because they want to concentrate, that's okay. But if someone is like intimating that this has become some sort of ritual, you do it loud, okay. no. If you're talking to God, you don't need to do it out loud. Now, uh, I want to kind of look at the third example that we gave, the, the example the Gemara gave. The Gemara says that someone who has a Muna, has food today, doesn't have food tomorrow, no big deal. What they're essentially saying is that God is real, and it's a very real thing, and God loves us, and God will take care of us, and if your dad didn't have food, I'm sorry, if you didn't have food in your cupboard today, but your dad is a billionaire who could feed you and the entire city, would you worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow? Mm. Of course not. Why would you even think about it? Right? Imagine this child of a billionaire goes rummaging through the cupboards, finds no food. Are they going to be up the whole night? War no, why would you worry? Well, if you actually have Amuna, real Amuna, if it was kind of an unquestioned, this, was, this is reality, why would you worry? It seems asinine to worry. Your, your, your father literally is a billionaire. And literally loves you and literally will take care of you and feed you. Why would you have to worry about anything? In our example, I don't think people stay up at night worrying whether or not miracles of agriculture will still work. Does anyone worry about it? Are there any conferences to discuss it like global warming or climate change or anything like that? Why not? We should all be worried about it. Because no, we take that as fact. But you can't explain it. It's inexplicable for you. How, how do you take it as fact? You have to have some sort of contingency plan, right? We have no contingency plan. That's the way someone who has real immunity, there's no contingency plan. This is fact, and why would you think any, uh, uh, any other possibility is insane yeah, to suggest? That's, that's an interesting proposition because, you know, we all like to have plan A and plan B. You know, maybe plan C. Okay, but set, maybe it's good to have it, but suppose someone does not have it. That's the question. The Talmud is not suggesting someone sh who does have uh, abundance should throw it away. No, no, I'm just saying, in other words, you, you, you're saying, I have this strategy, plan A. Yes. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to drop plan B. If that doesn't work, I'm going to drop plan C. And what if all of them don't work? No, but I mean, is, does that mean the person doesn't have as much faith as the guy that just... Not necessarily. Plan a? Not necessarily. The Talmud is working with someone who does not have a plan B. Their only plan is to rely on God. But there is some sort of touch point where all of our plans are extinguished, right? What if plan A doesn't work, and plan B, and plan C, and plan D, and plan Z, right. and plan AA, and BB, and ZZ? Well, then... Well, then there's a time... Well, then you rely on God, right? Yeah. Or you're worried. Which one is it? Well, Rabbi, isn't this, so, 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 if so, someone so. relies on God, they can never have anxiety. If someone has the faith that the Talmud describes, there can never be any anxiety. 
Like it's not possible. How could how could you possibly be anxious about anything? So they just never. Complain. They can never complain about anything. How could they complain about anything? Nothing. Well, obviously, this is a very high level. But the core idea is that faith is not a ritual. It's realism. It's running water. When you open up the faucet, there's always running water. Oh, that exists, right? And you're not surprised by it. It's not something you have to rely upon it. Will it work? Will it not work? Oh my gosh, what do you think? Right? It's, it's just what you associate as fact. It's just the way it is. That is the way Emuna uh, in this high level is described. We don't, we're not there yet. I'm, I'm, I don't think any one of us is here. I don't know if anyone in the city is there yet. I don't know. But this is what, this, and this obviously shows us there's a long way for us to get from where Amuna is theoretical, maybe Amuna is cognitive, to Amuna is actually our reality. And the fact that this table is here, and the fact that there's a cop behind me, I better, I better not speed, that is real, and God is as real. It, it's as real to me. So all of the multitudes that are worried about the ramifications of global warming are, by definition, not, uh, not believers, not, not, don't have the faith, don't have the uh, amuna. Are you trying to goad me into political statement here? <laughs> Jay? Well, yes. Okay. I, I agree with that. I agree if people really had this level of amuna, they wouldn't talk about gl uh, climate change at all. About, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. What about common sense? Now, I don't think people have this level of immunity, as evidenced by the fact that people do obsess over this. What about common sense? I mean, you can have all the immunity you want, and you can believe in whatever. You put a, a seed in the Sahara Desert, it's never going to grow. I agree. So there's certain things that common sense nowhere, has to get into this. So. But nowhere are we told to abandon common sense. Okay. But this, these are examples to bring out an idea. The idea is that our relationship with God, prayer is a great example. It's not in the Sahara, it's every day, multiple times. What are we doing? Are we engaging in a ritual? We're we talking to the king of all kings, the power of all powers, <coughs> the infinite entity that created the world. Which one is it? Yeah, are we just, are we just talking to nobody? Or, that, 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 that's the question. Do we have faith or do we not have faith? And it's possible for someone to say, oh, I have a little bit of faith and I have a little bit more and it's in my head, it's in my heart. That's a big chasm between the head and our heart, right? And that shows really where we fit in along this line. Do we have real faith? Is our faith just cultural faith? I think that there's the first step in someone's acquisition of faith is usually via their society. The parents, their community, their school, their religion. That's where they get their first... They dip their toe into, into the sea of faith, of Amuna. And that's a very surface level because that's not even something someone requires on their own. They were just indoctrinated into it. It's not acquired in any way. It's not cognitive. They didn't reach some sort of a mental calculation to get there. It was just something that they were told and maybe never questioned it. And that's okay. But it doesn't mean that they have achieved the level of faith that is the requisite level of faith that, that they could say, I'm a man of faith. And maybe we can possibly reach a man of faith. Maybe we can have a little bit of faith. But the point is, the, the, the delta between cultural faith and realism in our faith is vast. And it's a lot of room to do it. And by the way, says the Rabban, how do we do that? How do we bridge that gulf? Mitzvahs. Of course, faith is one mitzvah out of 613, certainly, or one or two, on a kind of more narrow sense, but transitioning a person from the earliest elements of their relationship with God to make it ever more real and to make it so unquestioned, it's not even impressive. Moshe's talking to God. He's not even making a big deal about it. Why? Because that's normal for him. That's his reality. To make it more normal for us, to make us not surprised when God actually exists in a tangible way in our life, there's a lot of room to run. But that's, so, but that's the same, or actually slightly opposite, when people of lesser faith say 
you know, that they believe in God. Maybe they even keep Shabbos and such and so forth. But they have to go get a job because they don't truly believe that God will provide. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Shobar Echai said, someone who goes to get a job doesn't have Amuna. That's exactly what it says. Why would someone go and work, uh, you know, painting houses or being an accountant when God will provide for you if you really believe, well, right? That's how, that's how God provides. It's all part of His plan. Man has to work to. Okay, that's that's another opinion. But Rabbi Shmuel Chai does make this. He does say this, and you know what? He's well, right for certain people. Well, does it sound stupid? But emo- imagine, okay, but the, maybe it's not so hard for imagine. Suppose someone's father was literally a billionaire. Does it make sense for them to go put in the 80 hours a week at uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper to make $43,000 a year? Does that make sense? No. Of course not. Well, your dad, is, your dad, i.e. God, is richer than any billionaire out there. Why would you do that? So I'm saying, I agree. This is someone of a very high level of faith. But at least the, lo- the logic is sound. Obviously, we're not holding like that. And by the way, says... Rabbi Yishmael, he argues with Rabbi Shemayi. He says, no, we have to do what we need to do. We have to get a job. We can't rely on that because we're lying that we'll end up hungry yeah. because we won't really have faith. Common sense comes into it for you to recognize what God is doing to provide. I mean, that reminds me of the joke for everybody who's probably heard. There's a flood. And, and this guy's, you know, God's going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. But it's getting higher and higher. And finally, he's on the roof of this house. When a canoe comes by, he doesn't get in the canoe, God will take care of me. A rowboat comes by, doesn't get in the rowboat, God will take care of me. A powerboat comes by, doesn't get in the powerboat, God will take care of me. Finally, the water comes up, he's drowning, he says, God, I faith you, why didn't you take care of me? He says, who do you think sent those three boats? So, you have to recognize... I, 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 I agree with everyone, with what everyone's saying here. I'm just saying... That this is a whole. This, I have a whole class on this on this particular subject. So I'm saying it very very quickly here. But there is an argument from 2,000 years ago with the great sages of their time, and one of them is more kind of an ideological position, and one is a more pragmatic position. I agree with all of you. None of us should say we shouldn't get a job, because that's the pragmatic position, and it's only for someone like Rabbi Shimon who, by the way, spent 13 years in a cave with nothing. And God gave him a carob tree, and he wrote the Zohar, that's right, with the son. That's an exception. Of course, for us, we better get the job. Because even though our dad is a billionaire, we don't believe it. We don't have him enough. The, the ox don't seem to be with us. Huh? The ox don't seem to be with us. Well, the odds don't seem to be with us, but the odds are not random. We choose our odds. No, but I mean, the odds were with that guy, with the carob tree. Well, the odds... I don't think the odds were them. He had someone whose amuna was so real that the kind of uh, it was like Don. The idea is that whenever someone upgrades their reality of their amuna, God upgrades the way they treat, he treats them. So if someone actually treats God as a billionaire dad, God will actually treat them as a son, as opposed to someone who treats God as an idea. God will treat us also as kind of as an idea. So we choose the relationship. It's a separate discussion. Either way, I think the, um, the core idea I wanted to get to today is what Amuna is. Amuna is the notion of someone having a reality of an a, a, a impossible to fully comprehend and invisible truth and fact and living and behaving in line with that fact. That's what Amuna is. And wherever we are and how real that is, is wherever we are on our path to Amunah. Lastly, the mitzvos broadly are going to help nudge us from step to step all the way unto the highest heights of Amunah. This was an absolute pleasure to take over on Muslim Mondays. I'm looking forward to next week to kind of see how this actually works. We have faith in being here. Oh, do you really believe it? Yeah. Do you really believe it? <laughs> this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying.
Okay, uh, to all our friends on Facebook, signing off over here. This was a lot of fun, and I look forward to the next time.